what we do at CCSI. Um, so welcome again to back to the speaker series. Um, so grateful for all of you being here, but especially for our speaker today, um, who we managed to bring to New York from across the ocean, thanks to a couple other um, uh, activities here in New York. So we have Giorgio Sacerdoti. Perfect. You got it. From University of Bocconi. <laughs> I'm learning uh, some of the details of Italian language. So um, Giorgio teaches at the University of Bocconi in, in Milan, um, and also was a member of the WTO Appellate um, Body, which is quite interesting for our work. Former. And former. Former. Was, was a member, I said, yes. Um, and today is speaking on whether BITS can be made more supportive of sustainable development friendly foreign investment, which again is a topic very dear to us. So thank you, and I'll turn it over right away. Thank you very much, Jean. <coughs> Hi, everybody. I'm very pleased to be back here because I did my master here so long ago that there is no memory more. <laughs> but I think it was the first or second year when this building had been just finished. And uh, the big event was the blast they did in order to excavate for the SIPA uh, building, which was not yet there. So <laughs> we looked at lunch, <laughs> boom, boom. <laughs> no, they, they had this primitive system then. Nowadays, say, well, is this a terroristic attack? But at that time, it was just blasting to, to build. Yes, so I, uh, I'm happy also to be back. And I did come back from time to time to, to lecture or for conferences and so on. Last time was a couple of years ago for Professor Dick Garner, retirement. He had a conference. I think that was three years ago. So. so uh, thank you for having invited me to this series, and thank you for being here. Um, I had an opportunity to, to investigate this specific field, investment protection and sustainable development, uh, when I was invited two years ago to present a paper on this at a conference at the Free University of Berlin. Uh, they take a lot of time to come out with a book. so. I have submitted my paper and revised my paper a couple of times, but apparently Oxford University Press is still in the process of, uh, of publishing this, this collective volume. Uh, I'm not even sure of the title yet, but um, uh, this paper I have updated and, and made some reflections. So I, I will, I think we, we uploaded it, uh, the full paper for those who are interested in more formal uh, reflections. And I make here a kind of summary of, of, my, of, of my thinking and what is uh, currently the discussion on these two issues. Now, you know, uh, when they gave me this title, there are two quite different uh, issues. Sustainable development is predominantly not legal. It's an economic and policy issue which has been with us for a long time, although there have been efforts continuously to give uh, a legal sense also to this issue. Is sustainable development a principle of international law, for instance, or, or does it include uh, a series of principles. Of course, when we say legal, then we go to, to right and duties, and that makes it difficult. Uh, who has the obligation to, to engage in, in, in promote sustainable development? Is there just one, uh, one definition of sustainable development? What is the difference between simply development as was the traditional concept, and what is this concept of sustainable development, uh, so which was an addition that was made uh, in the last, let's say, 20 or 30 years after the Rio summit. Uh, and is it, can you measure the progress towards sustainable development? Because all this is, of course, key then to understand where bilateral investment treaties fit in, or the role of foreign investment in supporting, not just the role of the treaties, but the role of foreign investment in order to uh, foster and support uh, sustainable development. 
And of course, your institute is very much, which is not just devoted to law, is very much interested uh, in these kinds of, uh, of issues. Uh, one could think that when we speak of sustainable development, it is basically for developing countries. Oh, I see a former student of mine who is supposed to be in Luxembourg, but I see he is here. But will you be next week in Luxembourg attending my class? So you see we are <laughs> Gabriele Ruscala. Yes, I go back to Europe and then I'm supposed to go to this. So one would think that the sustainable development is a concept uh, which address especially to developing countries, especially to least developing countries. But it's not really so. For instance, if you take uh, the European Union uh, mandate, the European Council mandate to the European Commission for the negotiation of the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, this famous and elusive TTIP, uh, sustainable development is very prominent there. And I'm not sure that what they mean here for as sustainable development goals and requirements is the same that, I don't know, uh, uh, sub, sub Saharan African countries we consider relevant for them. Here it says that this agreement, so it's an internal European document, this is not shared, it's a basis for the negotiation which was disseminated, it, it is from 2013, but it was disseminated la a few months ago. This agreement should recognize that sustainable development is an overarching objective of the parties, and that they will aim at ensuring and facilitating respect, and here you have some definition, of international, environmental, and labor agreements and standards while promoting high level of protection for the environment, labor, and consumers, consistent with the EU and member state legislation. The agreement should recognize that the parties, so EU and the uh, United States, will not encourage trade or foreign direct investment by lowering domestic, environmental, labor, or occupational health and safety legislation and standards or by relaxing core labor standards or policies and legislation aimed at protecting and promoting cultural diversity. That is uh, the French baby, the cultural diversity, you know? uh, la diversité culturelle. So uh, here you have a list of items which are listed under uh, sustainable development. Uh, it doesn't say, for instance, of higher level or of income, of social standard. When you go to the UN documents and you see that sustainable development is, uh, it comes from the Millennium Goals, and then now we are have the sustainable development goals that UNCTAD promotes to be adopted possibly at the next UN General Assembly at the end of 2015. You have fighting poverty, reducing <laughs> extreme poverty, uh, health condition, uh, wa availability of clean water for the majority of the population, uh, educational minimal standards against uh, uh, <coughs> illiteracy. So you have all standards that, of course, between Europe and United States are basically have been reached a long time ago and are not. Uh, relevant anymore, uh, fighting uh, diseases, for instance, in, in the world context, uh, this is very important. So sometimes one has the impression that sustainable development has become a catch-all concept, which moved from environment, as it was found, that is to preserve the environment for future generations. So to have economic development, use natural resources, promote industrialization, but leave resources untouched and able to renew themselves for the future use of humanity and not deplete the resources, natural resources and uh, the environment. If, if the 
uh, global uh, temperature goes on and so glaciers are melting, etc., then the environment will not be preserved for future generations. So you have here uh, concepts which are not uh, uh, are politically discussed, I mean, and, uh, and, uh, and therefore they are open to negotiations. What I would like also to point out here is that are these kind of global standards or national standards? Because many of these things are global. You can see a, you know, a poverty, extreme poverty, the World Bank says, has been consistently substantially reduced in the last 15 years since the Millennium Objective. But this is saying to the fact that uh, the fight has been successfully mostly in China and in India, and since these two countries by themselves contain, I think, the majority of the de developing world population, you get this. Doesn't mean that in Myanmar or, or other countries or in Africa you have had the same success. Uh, but the global figures, of course, it's a well-known story that if I eat two chicken and you eat no chicken, today then each of us has eaten on the average one chicken and the statisticians are happy. Okay, you just eat Italian pizzas, it's fine, all the same. <laughs> <coughs> so it's rather elusive. And then here you come in with the role of uh, foreign investment. And foreign investment is especially considered as foreign direct investment, as you know, which meaning uh, bringing uh, capital, but also other technical resources, managerial resources uh, from one country, from those who have it, which are mostly private companies, to other, company, uh, to other countries, excuse me, in order to uh, put them in productive use with the idea that by this, uh, the level of the economy will improve in, in a poor country which has not enough of these resources, capital or, or human resources to develop, and uh, uh, therefore will increase also uh, international cooperation. Now, once upon a time, when I started dealing with this, it wasn't so generally accepted that foreign capital was per se a positive, the influx of foreign capital. There was a lot of reservation by developing countries. There was the idea of self-centered development or import substitution. You don't import capital from abroad from large multinationals, but you try to develop it yourself through maybe financial and technical assistance of international organization. This has changed substantially because, for instance, my paper I, I started with the preface that UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon has made to the last uh, UNCTAD investment report, the one for 2000, issued in 2014. The Secretary General is a panegyric to the role of foreign investment. Uh, after the decline in 2012, global foreign direct investment flows rose again in 2013, although apparently they leveled again in 2014. This demonstrates the great potential of international investment, along with other financial resources, to help reach the goals of a post-2015 agenda for sustainable development. Transnational corporations can support this effort by creating decent jobs, generating export, promoting rights, respecting the environment, encouraging local content, paying fair taxes and transferring capital, technology, and business contacts to spur development. So foreign investment can do all this. Of course, it's not said that in all cases all uh, this uh, is being done. So what I would like to, to point out that many of these points and these issues depend from the local government. That is, also, if we come to for the role of foreign investment and then the role of investment treaties, uh, there is a lot of expectation that uh, the foreign investors will behave correctly, must behave correctly, and must cooperate to the attainment of these, let's say, 
social goal in the host country where they make their investment. But I think we should very much not forget that the principal responsibility is on the shoulders of the governments of the host countries themselves, <coughs> government, society, parliament, and whatever. Uh, the, uh, th and it's for them to set conditions for the foreign investors that, on one hand, will not make it too difficult and uneconomic, then investments are in the hands of private company. There is a word competition for investment of capital, so that if a country makes it too difficult, then investors may go to another country. They will not uh, build uh, uh, a new uh, manufacturing facility in Argentina, but they will do uh, make it in Brazil, not in Venezuela, but in Colombia. You have also to, to, to think that there is a massive twin liberalization which have been established in the world, so that countries may compete as, as a destination of capital and of investment, because foreign investment not only look at the local market, but they also look from building in that market to export at least regionally. And the fact that there are so many now free trade agreements, preferential trade agreements, encourages exactly this, a higher dimension, so that uh, you may decide that you want to invest in Indonesia or Malaysia because uh, they are both part of ASEAN and there are hardly any, let's say, uh, trade barriers among the, those countries. And so uh, the capital uh, will move from one country to the other. I lectured in, in Hanoi a few years ago. I met uh, the managers of Piaggio, the Italian company that manufactures Vespa. And they explained to me that they manufacture there in Vietnam, but the motors uh, come from China. But now China has become expensive, and they will uh, put a plant in Indonesia, and uh, no, not so much here, uh, in, in Vietnam. And then from Indonesia, they will serve the whole area. So uh, this has to be taken also into account. Now, uh, as to this. Uh, social principles, the multinationals uh, should now are addressees directly of UN principles. The UN guiding principles on business and human rights, the so called Ruggie, Professor Ruggie principle of 2011, are addressed directly to the multinationals, saying you should not lower the standard, you should have high uh, labor standard, environmental standard in your factory. Uh, the disposal of garbage, all these things, irrespective of the level of that country. You should not just be a good citizen under that country's standard, but under global standard. That may be, uh, it's more expensive for you. you. It's more difficult for you to compete with local business who are not held to the same standards or labor, child labor, use of labor, recognition of the core labor standards uh, of the ILO. So. Uh, there is also this direct uh, uh, standards for companies, and we are maybe dependent of the one that the government imposes. But still, I mean, the responsibility is on government. And I think sometimes this is overlooked by those who maybe criticize foreign investment, foreign investors. Uh, they must be the title of my conference, supportive uh, of sustainable development uh, FDI and supportive of the development of the country. <coughs> and it's a fact that many of those countries are dictatorships. They don't respect basic human rights very often. There is a lot of corruption going on uh, in many of those countries. And then I think it's also unfair not to see the, the whole picture and, think, and, and put certain responsibility of, on the shoulders of the foreign investors rather than on the shoulders of the government. They are ruling elite, and many are very often uh, democracy is a mockery or is apparent. And look, even the fight of the Chinese Communist Party against corruption within China, which is an endemic factor. Of course, it's also an endemic factor in Italy, so I will not come here to lecture about fighting corruption in, in other countries. Uh, and uh, 
it's a fight also within Italy, but in many societies. So when one looks at the role of uh, uh, foreign direct investment in developing countries, like most, if we don't look at the, what was written in the transatlantic blueprint so much, uh, uh, it's a two-side effort, and companies investing in those markets, which bring mostly of advantages to the local economy, find themselves often faced with an environment which is difficult because certain values are not respected. And to close on this chapter, I think there is a, a recent development which is not sometimes overlooked from this part of the world, that foreign investors uh, used to come from northwestern part of the world. So there were the large US, Canadian, European, Japanese companies. But that's not like that anymore. Now, Chinese companies are important. Indian steel companies have bought uh, most of the European steel industry, for instance. And you have Brazilians and other countries. Everybody is familiar with the Chinese investment in Africa, for instance, looking to develop natural resources, mostly for the need of the Chinese economy. And sometimes these companies are not held to the same standards that Western companies are, because Western companies are also held responsible by their shareholders in their annual meeting, and shareholders are also non-profit organization. There are pension funds who, who are very active, especially in this country, to, to check how their companies uh, behave. But it's not so in many of those countries. Many of these new sources of foreign capital are state-owned companies, SOE, state-owned enterprises, as they are often called. Some are directly owned by the government, like sovereign wealth fund, which is money which certain states with especially natural resources exporting oil and gas accumulate and then invest put in these funds and invest not just in u.s treasury bills but also in in industries around the world and and there is an issue also whether the what are the standards that these companies uh, follow Santiago principles are rules which have been voluntarily promoted by the IMF and and uh, followed by those governments, uh, those f entities. But uh, this is not often transparent. So that there is a renewed risk. Uh, I don't say of a race to the bottom, but somehow. Uh, that uh, while higher standards are being elaborated, like by the UN for responsible uh, companies and foreign investors, there are new entrants in the market that uh, are not very sensitive, uh, to say the least, uh, to those standards. There is a lot of complaint in African countries, for instance, about uh, the difficulty of First, the Chinese companies have been welcome in, but then now some of these countries find it difficult to deal with these companies, especially when they, they are directly and directly owned by the Chinese government. So there is also political relations, not just an economic and business relation. So I will come now to the second part, that is, in view of this picture, uh, what is the role of bilateral investment treaties, not just foreign investment from an economic point of view, but legally the rules, that is, do uh, the rules of those treaties, uh, which are um, aimed basically to protecting the foreign investor from arbitrary conduct, let's say, in the host country, uh, be geared in a way that they also promote uh, these objectives of sustainable development, those at least that are relevant for, for, the, foreign, uh, for the role of the foreign investment. I will answer you immediately saying that I am rather skeptical on that. You know? I'm rather skeptical. May I take this off because it's really warm. 
for a variety of we uh, oh wait but I can't <laughs> I'll put it here here we are and and one should uh, uh, focus on what is uh, origin and aim of, of these bilateral investment treaties. Now, uh, uh, they are again in the, in the, in, 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 at the attention of uh, broader audience because uh, from purely bilateral, now there are these regional negotiations Pacific Atlantic of, of trade treaties, uh, of, um, uh, FTAs or uh, free trade areas, which now have also an investment chapter. These agreements didn't, usually didn't have an investment chapter. Only NAFTA has also an investment chapter, but they had remained unique for a long time. Like the European Union did not have a competence in, in, in investment, only in trade. So the trade agreements of the European community first and then Union now uh, didn't have an investment chapter. This has changed with the Lisbon Treaty in 2009 and so now the European Union is empowered also to negotiate uh, the regime of investment. Now, uh, these treaties traditionally had a limited, a limited coverage, let's say. I would say uh, they, they used to be static and light. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, static because they are not instruments who look to the future to promote, to, to give incentive. They are uh, just uh, uh, setting certain minimum standards uh, for the treatment of foreign investment. By the way, they are basically bilateral. So they concern only the, let's say, US investment in Congo, Italian investment in South Africa, uh, or uh, Chinese investment in Chile. Uh, they don't have a broad uh, coverage. So they are bilateral, and really they put, uh, traditionally, I think you're familiar, minimum standards of treatment. So non-discrimination, MFN treatment, most favored nation, national treatment, uh, uh, protection against expropriation with the obligation to give uh, compensation, uh, certain traditional expropriation being direct expropriation, so confiscation, taking, in US legal language, taking of property, but also uh, measures amount, intent amounting to taking. So restriction that would go so far that the property is not worth much more. And, and the Iran-US tribunal has led a lot of case law uh, on that in the past, of course. And then certain specific rights which interest foreign investment, like the right to bring back out of the country the dividend, the profit, the royalties, the right to repatriate the capital if you disinvest, and some specific rights like uh, the right of bringing in uh, top management and get visas for them to run a company. Uh, they, these treaties traditional are only what we would say post-establishment, that is once and a foreign investor uh, is in, has decided to establish, bring capital, people, uh, know-how, patents, then it enjoys this level of protection. But they usually don't grant the right to make investment. They don't grant the right of market access. So if in my example, uh, China and Chile, but Chile, uh, does not admit foreign investment in a certain sector or it, it limits it to under strict requirements, that's quite compatible with a bilateral investment treaty. Of course, if you don't admit any invest, foreign investment anywhere, then there is no point of making such a treaty, of course. But uh, so uh, this limits traditionally also the, the impact uh, 
of these treaties. Or, although the U.S. has tried to expand in recent years, and nominally U.S. bilateral investment treaties also provide for the why to make an investment. But then there is a negative list in the appendix because in the U.S. itself, uh, many sectors are close to foreign investment like uh, nuclear energy, uh, uh, naviga commercial navigation b between within the United States waters and so on. So at the end, sometimes uh, broadcasting, TV broadcasts. So at the end, very often, uh, this I think this uh, right to make investment even in these treaties are rather limited. So. What is interesting, these treaties are not geared to specific investment. Uh, they don't, the, the parties are not, to, are not bound to give facilities to those who make an investment, for instance. It's not that if you make an investment under the treaty, you get a tax reduction, or you will get some incentive to build. If, if uh, uh, I think, North Carolina want to get any given incentives to BMV to make a factory, that's not in a bilateral investment treaty. This is a direct dealing under the laws of the country, of the province. If the state wants to push investment in the mineral sector, in a backward sub part of the country, that's for the laws. And they will advertise this domestically and, and abroad. So in this sense, they, they are uh, static. They grant this minimum standard. And why so? Well, it's a historical origin because traditionally they were um, started to be made in the 50s and 60s when newly decolonized countries challenged the obligation to protect the property of foreigners. Foreigners at that time were often people of the former colonial regime who had acquired during the colonial regime vast estates of land, things Belgium in the Congo and so on. And these countries wanted to get rid, and they proposed a new international economic order, no special protection for foreigners, right to expropriate without any standard of compensation. And to react to that, from the custom international law, countries went to the bilateral, to the treaty law, when they were interested in protecting these investments. And this then has expanded because the new international economic order and this socialist approach to development was unsuccessful. And now these treaties have become very standard. And you have treaties also between countries which you wonder really whether between Slovenia and Uruguay, let's say, there, there will be really, there are bilateral investments that uh, justify the existence of a treaty. There, they are just very standard. And then once upon a time, it was, you know, the first treaty was Germany with Pakistan to encourage German investments to Pakistan. But now they go both ways. So a, a, an agreement between India and a European country, or now the European competence, is as well for European investments to India as to in Indian investments uh, to, to the European Union. Then the final point in this treaty, which is, of course, very well known and somehow peculiar, is the direct arbitration. That is, how do you enforce those rights for private investors? By the way, these rights was meant, were meant not just in the abstract. The idea is that by granting this level of legal protection with custom international law did not grant anymore, uh, you would promote investment, let's say, uh, having a treaty between Germany and Pakistan in the 50s, the idea was that German companies would be more, feel more secure to invest in Pakistan than if there would be no treaty. But this is no guarantee that any company will, in fact, invest in Pakistan. If Pakistan is in turmoil, if taxation is high, if, uh, if good governance is not ensured, then maybe those companies will not invest, notwithstanding the existence of a treaty. A very well-known example is Brazil. Brazil is, I think, the only major country which never engaged in a, a policy of signing, entering bilateral investment treaties. There is a lot of foreign investment in Brazil all the same, because Brazil is a very large economy. It's an important country. It had a big development. Uh, and if Fiat decided to make a factory for Fiat cars, it did, and Volkswagen in Brazil, they did it because the market conditions were interesting. 
irrespective of the fact that there was or not a bilateral investment treaty. So to ensure this level of protection, the other item which was quite original is this direct arbitration, as you may know. You, that is, if a foreign investor of the relevant country thinks that its rights under the treaty have been breached, it can start, after certain procedural uh, steps, a direct arbitration in an international setting against the host state to revendicate its right. And if it wins, it cannot have the legislation change. This is a difference, for instance, with the WTO, where instead it's government to government dispute, and the solution is not money damages, but it is a withdrawal of the incompatible measures. Here in direct arbitration is monetary compensation, which finally the companies is what their interest. Business, if you can't not, you, are, you lose money, you are curtailing your investment, at least you get out or partly or totally and you get damage. Now this mechanism was thought of uh, for a precise reason at the time, 56, is to avoid government being mixed up in this dispute, especially the home country government. You know, the idea was a powerful American or British government that would press a poor African and American or Latin American country, saying, you behaved badly with my investors and I put pressure on you, which, by the way, is what happened uh, with the U.S. and Chile governments of Allende when the social government of Allende nationalized uh, the copper indices belonging to American companies. So the idea of having a neutral forum, you have anything to do, you go to an arbitration, there will be independent arbitrators, the parties will pick them, there will be a forum like the World Bank through the exit multilateral convention, which is optional, so if the government doesn't appoint uh, uh, its arbitrator wants to block the procedure, there is a mechanism that the procedure goes on, like in international commercial arbitration, and then the decision has, is recognized automatically by all the exit member countries or by all the countries concerned. So now various of these aspects, I'll, I'll finish now, have been criticized recently. So let's start for the end. This mechanism which wanted to, why? To protect the foreign investor, why? Because the courts of the host states were considered often unreliable. Don't forget that these cases are brought against the government. And in many countries of the world, you cannot be sure that courts will be so independent from the government that they will uh, recognize the right of a foreign investor against the government. Judges maybe have been appointed by the government. The judge, uh, the government may revoke. I was in a case uh, uh, in Argentina in which you were famous with the new uh, government uh, uh, change one after the other. The majority of the judges of the Supreme Court of Argentina was not a question of foreign investors until the new majority decided that the laws which had blocked uh, changed the, the, the currency parity. So was not inconstitutional, but was constitutional. So, so something that here in the United States you wouldn't think. Once the judges are appointed, they are appointed and they are independent and so on. So that's why it was a reason to have, you, you cannot pretend that uh, that foreign country will come to the courts of United States and subjects to another sovereign agent judge. So the idea of international arbitration is, uh, appears to be fair. Now, this has come under criticism in recent times, saying, well, isn't that at the end of the day a privilege of the foreign investor? The local investor has to go to local courts and cannot invoke a treaty with a foreign state, whereas the foreign investors get this special treatment. This has been raised now in the transatlantic negotiation. Because usually those country, those arbitration is in these bilateral treaties when the back is, well, I don't want to go to the Chinese court. I don't want to go before the Italian courts. Let's go to a neutral arbitration. But one could th the think between Europe and, and the United States, I mean, courts are fair and surely they are not subservient to the government and would uh, to be unfair against a foreign party. 
Uh, but of course, it, it has become an idea, a feature of this tweet. So can, and then, as you can see, these tweets have only obligations upon the government. They are for the benefit of the foreign investor. So that the, either country, in respect of the investor of the other, will grant national treatment, fair and equitable treatment, which is a general standard which now many people say, well, it's a little bit vague. Non, no indirect expropriation. What about the regulation? When does legitimate regulation in the general interest hit so much a specific foreign investor that it becomes uh, uh, an indirect uh, uh, expropriation for which uh, compensation should be paid? Uh, why is it so that it's only one way? This also has been criticized. Well, because the foreign investor uh, gets this protection. The local government is the sovereign of the country. They have all the power. They don't need to have rights against a foreign investor which invests in their country under treaty. They just apply the law. You are a foreign investor, a local investor, and build a factory there, and you don't follow the New York state regulation on, on environmental standard. well, the police will come, the, the Department of Health will block your factories. You don't need to go to international arbitration in order to, to compel that uh, foreign investor uh, to, to behave correctly. So this is, you don't respect the, the general laws on, on, on labor standard and health on the labor place, well, the, 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 the police department will come and shut you, uh, your factory. And if you have a crime, you will conduct yourself criminal, the manager, American or foreigner, will, will be brought to court and, and end up in jail. So uh, one has to think why these treaties are done like that. So can now these treaties, can we put in obligations on the company so that, uh, you know, uh, there is an incentive to make, especially in developing countries, least developed countries, uh, uh, sustainable development friendly uh, uh, investment. Well, I come back to my point. It is a responsibility of the host country saying, okay, you want to build a factory in this part of the country, we welcome this. Uh, Please uh, hire a lot of people, give good jobs, prepare the manpower. It's for the government to do it. It's not so much to put it in the treaty. Uh, usually the, the treaty has, if a country wants to screen for an investor and say, uh, I want investment in the, uh, uh, I don't want them in service, in banking, in insurance, I have enough. I want them to develop uh, new technology. Okay, you can give incentives to develop, you, know, you can make agreement with foreign investors and, and say to Apple, come here, or to Google, come in my place, and don't go to China, but come to India. It's, you don't need the treaty. So I think uh, these treaties are not the, the really the instrument to, to, to direct investment, but they could have something more at least to what is now concerned, for instance, uh, there are concerns to avoid that certain standards are too broad and they may tie the hands of the government. So the definition of indirect expropriation. Also the US has a model BIT and they have restricting interpretative language as they're saying uh, it's not meant to give a higher protection than US laws give to US enterprises and citizens. It is uh, regulation, general regulation in the public interest normally will, cannot be considered to be uh, indirect expropriation. Uh, also fair and equitable treatment, for instance, the treaty between, which has between European Union and Canada, which is parallel to the TTIP, has already been drafted but not yet signed, limits what is fair and equitable treatment saying it must be a manifest disregard of procedural guarantees and so on. To whom is, are these uh, caveat adders? Well, they are obviously adders to the arbitrators in case of dispute. So if there will be a dispute, 
the arbitrators will find the, uh, the discretion somehow limited because one concern is it's not an ordinary court, you don't have the rule of precedence, arbitrators are picked by the parties, they can be you know, expert, but maybe they are not so expert, and, and let's give them guidance. But I think, on the other hand, if you go too far, then there is a risk that the protection afforded, and I'll finish with this to these treaties, uh, becomes very reduced. And the purpose of the treaties, especially in case of countries which have not a strong good governance, not the case of Europe or United States, will be lost. For instance, a device which has been uh, put in NAFTA is that there is a commission, there is a NAFTA tripartite commission that can give uh, a binding interpretation to what those articles mean. Now, they, these governments have two or three times given uh, binding interpretation. As you can imagine, they have given restrictive interpretation in the interest of the government. So. The, even if a U.S. company was claiming against Mexico, the interpretation that was given was not in favor of the U.S. company, but rather in favor of the three governments to avoid what they considered excessive uh, uh, claims made against the government. So, for instance, the idea that you have a treaty, you have independent in, in arbitration, so it's a form of justice, and then the governments come in and during maybe the proceedings say, Wait a minute, but this, uh, you arbitrators, this means only, only this, and it doesn't mean anymore that, uh, can also uh, be dangerous. This is uh, the idea how, of a more dynamic uh, uh, and not static uh, uh, life of these treaties. Uh, but surely, in some, in some respect, there is now an idea that the treaties should be more accurately calibrated. You could also think that if like Europe is negotiating a treaty with Singapore, with this small advanced uh, uh, service economy, it's different than if you negotiate with Sri Lanka, for instance. But of course, you don't know what will happen in 20 years. Maybe in 20 years also Sri Lanka will be a striving uh, uh, service economy and the needs will change. So, and treaties, you know, are not easy to change. Once they are signed, they remain there for a long time. And this is also, and I, I, I'll finish with that, an issue because if you enact new models and new thinking, you have a backlog of treaties, of hundreds of treaties, and if, if you go in, you know, if the U.S. goes back negotiating again with Congo and saying, look, but we have thought, then they will come back to and say, yes, but we also have now some new ideas. And, and very often in international treaties, uh, countries at the end, leave, if it's not a pressing need, they just leave it there before uh, it's true. There have been many disputes, many more disputes now that had been anticipated in the past, but there are not so many disputes uh, with countries that have a reasonably good governance and respect the right. Let's say respecting the rights of foreigners is also respecting the rights of nationals, usually. Those countries who behave badly with foreign investors very often behave also badly with domestic investors and their cities. Thank you very much. I think that was plenty, and I see I'm almost over my time. Well, we may lose some students who have to go to uh, class, but until we're kicked out, is there any other, any, any questions? Yes, Couple of questions. Yeah. Um, Michael, you mentioned that the treaty is still in effect. I, I have some diff w yes. Could you come in the middle yeah, of the yeah, table, yeah. maybe, because... <laughs> speak up louder. Okay, thank you. Um, I mean, I understand a bit what you're saying right now, the way we view investment, it's hard to foresee how BITS could have a positive impact on encouraging sustainable development. <coughs> but if, if the view is that we, there's a paradigm shift in how we see sustainable development, how important it is to hold parties with an increasing in, impact on Exporting countries and exporting countries both focus on investment. Would there not be a place for positive obligations within 
other realms, you can see it in finite things, you can see it with equator principles, you can see it happening with Laponian standards, so you can see it sort of making its way through. Could you not see that? But I don't know whether the BITs are are, are, are very appropriate. Sure, you can put some preambular language that come to it, like the principles that I have read from the European Union, that treaties are meant to encourage favorable investment, not to lower the standards. The Americans have done that. But it's still hotary language. If a country then wants to screen and say, I, I put higher levels of, uh, of, of health regulation and so, it can do it as a host country, I irrespective of the treaty. The risk might be that saying, well, you are uh, the famous Metanex case in a Canadian company in California. California put very higher standard to, to, to produce this chemical, and this Canadian company argued that they were being put out of business, and therefore they were entitled to, to compensation, which they didn't get because the claim was rejected. So. But that you can take care in by in the dispute. They said it's not uh, a new regulation, environmental regulation that affects everybody. It's not an uh, an expropriation. Yeah, you you one could add something, but I don't think that these are really the the basic instruments. Also, because you know you don't know what investment will be made under bilateral treaty. It can be a uh, a chain of pizzeria, it can be uh, a bank who goes into the country, it can be a large plant that may pollute the environment, and then uh, the local government should, uh, should uh, control the standards through normal legislation, or maybe the company through the UN guiding principle uh, has an independent obligation. That is how I see it. Let me throw out a related issue, a related question, probably taking it from a somewhat different angle. My impression for a long time has been that both in the context of trade agreements and in the context, although you see it less often, of bilateral investment treaties, the pressure for environmental provisions, labor provisions in these agreements, comes from the developed countries, not so much from the developing countries. And the purpose, pretty clearly, because the developed country generally already is abiding by these standards, and then some. And I've always thought the purpose at bottom is protectionist, a sort of paternalistic protectionism on the part of the developed country. And I've never quite understood why the developing country wants to have its hands tied uh, any more than, as you put it, earlier, any more than they would want to decide unilaterally themselves through their own laws and processes to impose higher labor standards or higher environmental standards on themselves. But is that what's going on? Am I right? Is that what's going on? Is this, is this big yeah. country protectionism by a more innocent name? Well, you know, uh, uh, let's put it in another way. There is more <laughs> sensitivity to these social values in our countries that in many of those developing countries, a traditional idea is, you know, if you don't have enough to eat every day, you, uh, uh, even in South and Italy, you prefer that your child goes to work and help in the pizzeria serving rather than going to school, uh, because it's an immediate advantage and you, you are not able, you know, to look at the long term. So uh, many, uh, I think there is a kind of benign imperialism uh, that what we impose on those countries, especially in trade. I mean, the U.S. agreement with Peru and so on, saying, okay, we open our market to your products, our U.S. market, but you will not cut the forest. Mm -hmm. You can say, excuse me, the business, what I want to have, I want to exploit my forest, is the business of Peru, it's not the business of the U.S. Or uh, the American trade unions look very much how the, in Colombia under the agreement uh, the U.S. didn't ratify because uh, the unionists, uh, the union people in Colombia were threatened and so on. Uh, it makes very good our conscience, but maybe it's not our business. The result is, of course, that you say uh, Colombian exports are somehow more, or Peruvian exports become 
uh, more, more expensive and it's easier to impose it on Peru, but if you try to impose it on China, uh, they will say, you know, <laughs> it's our business. And so in part it's true, but uh, the leveling of the playing field, the level of the playing field should be agreed. And I think the basic core, core, core labor standard is, is agreed. Uh, you have that other form like the WTO plus or TWIPS plus thing. Then, you know, uh, saying the Americans say the US or Europe saying, yes, we make an, an agreement. You will have preferential access to our market, but you have to protect our pharmaceutical products and our f uh, companies and our pharmaceutical patent more than you do. And those countries say yes, but you know, then the, the, the medical products will become more expensive and the population will not be able to, to have them. This is really political economy and, and power politics sometimes. Sure, if they breach Argentinian law. Uh, I mean, the foreign investors entering into a country are basically subject to local law as everybody. I'm visiting the United States, I'm subject to US law. Now, if they put me in jail uh, in a terrible way without me having done anything, then maybe the Italian consul will come and try to rescue me. So was that your point? Yeah, that is what I'm saying, because the, the local government has the, the, the power and the authority to enact and apply local laws. You might put like the European Union in the preamble saying neither country in order to induce will reduce. Now here comes American investor says, look, I'd make a huge plan. There was a paper mill case between uh, Uruguay, Argentina. Uh, on the river, we'll give a lot of uh, work, uh, we'll export a lot of paper, but uh, your, your, your anti-pollution standards are too high, lower them. And, and uh, we government may do it. Uh, and then the, the states here, states that say you should not do it, but it's an obligation between the government. Okay, I think. Thank you very much. <laughs> it was very nice. Thank you for the invitation. <laughs>